Uh, well, first off, welcome everybody to this presentation. Uh, but uh, uh, it's entitled uh, Four Bridges of Significance. And uh, these four bridges are bridges formerly on the Milwaukee Road main line between uh, Puget Sound and Eastern Washington. And they're each of these bridges, as you'll see, have a different construction technique and a and a different history and a different story. And the uh, the amazing thing about it, after the loss of the Milwaukee Road in 1980, uh, the state of Washington purchased the right of way or much of the right of way between uh, the Seattle watershed at Cedar Falls and the Idaho state line near Tico, Washington and uh, uh, develop what was the Iron Horse State Park or sometimes known as the John Wayne Pioneer Trail and is now known as the Palouse to Cascade State Park Trail, Washington's Cross State Trail. So these four bridges of significance have all gone through some kind of rehabilitation in this in the last few years since uh, since the year uh, 2015 or uh, actually uh, uh, later than that. And uh, so we'll present, uh, we'll take a cross-state tour. Uh, this presentation was an, initially um, part of an event in Rosalia, Washington, uh, out in the Palouse, known as Bridge Day, which uh, includes a, an in-person presentation. And, and I gave this presentation uh, for that event followed by an actual uh, tour of the right-of-way and the Rosalia Concrete Arch Bridge, which you'll be able to see uh, in this presentation later. So uh, uh, we uh, uh, invite you to a fall visit to Rosalia and an opportunity to experience Bridge Day and to experience one of these bridges. Uh, to, to share with you, uh, this is the uh, uh, a basic map of the Palouse to Cascades Trail starting at Cedar Falls at the edge of the Seattle watershed and extends all the way to, to the Idaho state line. There are some gaps in it, existing rail service uh, between uh, Othello and Royal City Junction and uh, between Othello <laughs> and Warden, uh, some gaps with... Uh, some gaps with uh, uh, Rock Lake, but uh, the uh, going east to west, the bridge. Uh, excuse me, going west to east, the bridges that we'll cover are the uh, Renslow Bridge, this Renslow Trestle over Interstate 90, the Beverly Bridge over the Columbia River, the uh, Concrete Arch Bridge at Rosalia over in eastern Washington, and finally. Uh, the Tico Bridge, or or as some people call it, the Tico Trussell uh, in Tico, Washington. Uh, so we hope you'll enjoy this tour on Washington's premier cross-state route, the former Milwaukee Road main line. Uh, our first uh, bridge is uh, Renslow. Uh, it uh, the unique thing was it was a wooden bridge uh, was replaced by a steel bridge shortly after the route was opened. Uh, the the uh, the uh, Milwaukee Road was opened through here in 1909 as part of the uh, Pacific Coast Extension, and after the bridge was uh, uh, this wooden bridge was put in place, it was replaced by steel girders as a permanent bridge that now exists today, which was uh, done in 1910. So as you can see, they're putting girders in during uh, under under load from the wooden trussel, from the wooden bridge. And um, it's one thing that's kind of amazing to do this is that the railroad was in operation when they were putting these steel girders in. So uh, oftentimes railroaders talk about track and time, meaning the maintenance away people or the engineering people getting the right to to shut down the, the track for hours or or even a day or so. Uh, this was happening while the railroad was in operation. 
And this is just an example of the plans for uh, for this bridge, intricate steelwork. It was obviously well engineered and well designed uh, with uh, uh, through their engineering department and and a lot of documentation on this, as you can see in the lower corner. It's the Chicago, Milwaukee, and Puget Sound Railway, uh, a subsidiary of the Milwaukee Road that uh, uh, that actually was in place on the Pacific Coast Extension during the construction era and, and during the early days of the Milwaukee operations. Uh, this is a, a photograph of, of the wonderful interpretive signs that uh, have been uh, put together at the Renslow Bridge. And uh, this, this photograph from 1964 by, uh, by Tom Gildersleeve shows so um, box cab electrics accompanied by a diesel powered GP9 going eastbound across the uh, across the valley. This was uh, uh, known as the Johnson Johnson Creek. Uh, a little bit of a drainage. There's uh, and just a, it started out as an animal track or in, and it was a footpath and maybe a, a little bit of a dirt road. And now, as you can see oh. in the upper photo, uh, that yeah. is a, it's a, it's a interstate 90. And the amazing yeah. thing about this is they were able to, uh, oh, okay. uh, there were no modifications Perfect. to this bridge to accommodate interstate 90. It was, it was that wide to, to do that. Uh, the Olympian Hiawatha um, crossed through this route, and this is just one glimpse uh, uh, from the Ainsworth collection uh, showing a, uh, a a dome car, a, a sky top, uh, uh, and a, uh, a sky top lounge. Uh, uh, in 1968, the interstate was under construction between uh, in various places between Seattle and uh, uh, and the Idaho border. And and right now, uh, the Renslow Bridge is is in this area here between between Ellensburg and Vantage. A Wayne Monger photograph of uh, of an eastbound diesel powered freight crossing over over the interstate. Uh, the electrification was uh, was gone by this time. All the Canton areas is, is removed. Uh, the uh, the electric high line uh, is is still in place. A Blair Koistra photo of an eastbound freight train and and here at Renslow is where is where we go through a, a bit of a climate and uh and ge geological transition from uh from river valleys of the Kittitas area a uh, irrigated agricultural area we kind of come into sagebrush and uh and and volcanic rock and uh and climbing into the uh volcanic hills of uh, the Saddle Mountains. Uh, the Milwaukee Road was abandoned in 1980. Uh, the rail was pulled up and uh, the decking, there was concrete decking over this bridge. And actually this bridge was a ballasted deck bridge, meaning uh, these, uh, if you can see these concrete uh, tubs, they were, uh, they were placed on top of the steel decking, filled with ballast with the rail on top of it. Uh, later on, that uh, uh, Department of Natural Resources removed uh, the decking so that people couldn't cross the bridge. And that was the way it stayed for a number of years. And uh, what we're doing is uh, 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 working with interpretive signs or just uh, kind of uh, doing some preliminary surveys of how we're going to a, a approach interpretation at the Renslow Bridge. The uh, Renslow Bridge was decked and, and 
extensive side rails were put on both to protect people on top of the bridge as well as to protect drivers down below on Interstate 90. There is uh, some bump outs or uh, 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 on the side for getting some views. And this is one of the first places going westbound on the Milwaukee Road where you can see Mount Rainier. So you can sometimes get great views of Mount Rainier kind of looking this, this direction. Uh, and this was reopened in 2021 as part of the Palooza Cascades Trail. And as mentioned, uh, there were a number of names for this trail after the Milwaukee Road abandonment and st uh, Washington State taking over. And most recently, it's become the Palooza Cascade State Park Trail, which has now become a recognized name across the state. And this is an example of uh, the signage used uh, here at the bridge. Uh, and Annually, every spring uh, in in late May, early June, the John Wayne Pioneer Wagons and Riders make a cross state ride. And this is an example. You can see horses going across the Renslow Bridge on the Milwaukee Road right of way. And leaving Renslow, our next bridge is Beverly, and just to uh, highlight this, uh, this is a an aerial photo taken by uh, Fred Wirt, who's uh, in our audience today, and uh, this is the Renslow Bridge right here. If you can, if you can make it out, right there, and the Renslow Bridge. From the Renzo Bridge, we climb up the Saddle Mountains to Doris through a tunnel at uh, on Boylston Hill. And uh, we continue over to the Columbia River down there. And this is an amazing, uh, amazing geological formation because this is the Saddle Mountains here on both sides of the Columbia River. And right there is known as Sentinel Gap where the Columbia River actually bisects the mountain range. So this is uh, this is the route of the, the Milwaukee Road across the Saddle Mountains over and down. And uh, it's uh, at 2.2%, it's the steepest grade on the Milwaukee Road main line. And uh, there've been legendary stories about runaways on this, uh, on this part of the track. But uh, as we continue, we'll focus on the bridges. Uh, the, uh, the next bridge is, of course, the Beverly Bridge across the Columbia River. It's uh, a 2,286 foot 16 span girder deck truss with one through truss. It was, it was built as a permanent bridge from the start, unlike the Renslow Bridge, which was uh, wood followed by steel construction. And uh, the, uh, the, this bridge was built well in advance of the railroad uh, uh, railhead reaching this location because of the, the years involved in, in, in making it from 1906 to 1909. So material came by steamboat to this location. It came out from, a lot of the steel came from Pennsylvania and, uh, and was uh, transferred at a place called Vulcan on the Great Northern Railroad near near uh, Rock Island and Wenatchee, uh, their crossing of the Columbia River and brought down to on site. And so this is an example, this is a, uh, this is not an aerial photo. This is actually taken from the Saddle Mountains uh, from Sentinel Gap, looking down on the Beverly side seeing the Beverly Bridge with a with a train across it. And there you can see the beginning of that 2.2% grade coming up the Saddle Mountains. The construction was, uh, this was a remote place. Uh, it, uh, construction was kind of difficult. Uh, uh, 
weather was a big factor. The Beverly, uh, the winds down the Columbia River are pretty legendary. And uh, uh, there were all sorts of factors, both its location and the uh, environmental and weather and climate uh, considerations, making this a difficult place to work. But uh, uh, it got done and uh, it was just a major engineering uh, feat. This is an example. This is uh, the steamboat St. Paul, a coal-fired steamboat, owned, uh, which was used to transfer material from that Vulcan inner uh, transfer point on the Great Northern Upriver down to the Beverly Bridge site. And uh, it ran up uh, downstream one day and would run upstream the next day. And this is uh, this picture was taken in uh, December uh, 1908. Uh, the interesting thing about the Beverly Bridge, I don't know if this is the uh, 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 construction engineer, but his name was Ralph Ober. Uh, he was uh, uh, worked in the field and uh, following his correspondence, he just uh, documents a lot of problems and a lot of difficulty building this bridge. But uh, uh, it's interesting that it turns out, I did a little research on Ralph Ober and Ralph Ober grew up in Beverly, Massachusetts. And the Beverly, Washington is named after Beverly, Massachusetts, as are a lot of places on the Milwaukee Road, including Boylston and Malden. Uh, so um, uh, we've got the origin of Beverly figured out and also, Ralph Ober went on after the building of the Beverly Bridge. Uh, he went on to being uh, having a, a a partner in an engineering company that designed the Aurora Bridge in Seattle on Highway 99. So there's when you go over the Aurora Bridge, you can you can feel a connection between that and this Beverly Bridge. The uh, uh, the construction of this bridge was was done with a lot of false work. The Columbia River, uh, the depth was not a major factor, but uh, uh, they uh, used a lot of uh, forms and false work to create uh, uh, coffer dams for pouring of concrete and to create the masonry piers. Once the masonry piers were in place, they did a lot of steel work to uh, just to span the bridge. And this is the one uh, through span apparently on this on this bridge. This is a uh, what we believe is an Ashel Curtis photo. Uh, a pastoral scene after the bridge is in place. Uh, it's before electrification, so it's before 1920, and it just kind of captures a very, a very uh, pleasant pastoral scene in what is a pretty dramatic location with the saddle mountains in the background. The Beverly Bridge, as I mentioned, was uh, electrified uh, from 1920 uh, to the early 70s. Uh, electric operations, electric trains uh, ran across this bridge uh, between uh, uh, Seattle, Tacoma, and Othello. And it was very, uh, uh, very efficient and very uh, useful for getting across the Saddle Mountain grades. And this is just a, a eastbound set of uh, four unit set of box cab motors crossing the Beverly Bridge. Later on, there was a transition uh, to diesel and uh, this Wayne Monger photo uh, captures a, an eastbound freight at the same, uh, at the same location. On the uh, west side of, of the Columbia River is a location known as Beverly Junction. And uh, 
this is a westbound freight about ready to crossing the river and ready to ascend that that grade up the Saddle Mountains toward Boylston and Boylston Hill. You can see this uh, kind of uh, this material alongside here. And this is sort of the floatsum and jetsam of debris from derailments that were caused by wind attacking the train on the Beverly Bridge or near the Beverly Bridge. And so the the winds here are legendary and they ha and they indeed have caused derailment. So uh, one one story uh from a uh, uh Harold Rasmussen, a section foreman out at uh who lived at Beverly was saying that he saw a uh uh a, a train with a a piggy, uh, piggyback trailer that had had blown off the blown off the uh, a flat car, and he called that in to Tacoma to the dispatcher or to somebody, and said a, a piggyback trailer just just blew off the train, and uh, he was kind of chided and said, "You don't know what you're talking about. That didn't happen." And then you can just imagine whatever, how many hours it takes for the train to go from Beverly to Tacoma. And hours later, the phone rang and it was Tacoma at the other end. And they were asking, did that trailer happen to, that, that trailer that you saw, did that happen to be a M-I-L-Z and, and rattling off a number of a specific trailer? So this, it actually did happen. Uh, and uh, right here on the left, you see this uh, this sign that says Beverly Junction. This is uh, uh, a project of the Cascade Rail Foundation where we are installing replica station signs at historic places and in, in named railroad places on the uh, uh, Palooza Cascades Trail to help uh, identify places to serve as waypoint markers, as well as to preserve the history of these uh, these locations on the railroad. And actually, Beverly Junction is the junction of the Hanford branch. Uh, kind of unusual, but the main line takes the curve and the, and the straight part goes into uh, what was it once a Y uh, that that brings a branch line over to Hanford, Washington, which was the uh, site of the Hanford work, uh, the super secret World War II uh, nuclear reservation. And the Hanford reservation is still in place, although it does not have rail service from this side, of course. So on the Beverly side, we're looking, uh, we're looking westbound toward the Saddle Mountains across the bridge with uh, the Cantonary, the electrical electrification still in place. And this is what it looks like today with a, with a uh, gravel trail taking you to the uh, concrete decking of the bridge. This is just something that came up uh, during the construction. I didn't realize this was happening, but they actually have watermarks of um, showing the different levels of water in, embedded in Roman numerals on the concrete piers of the bridge. And this was taken by project engineer Adam Fulton during the, uh, during the decking and rehabilitation of the Beverly Bridge. Beverly served as a helper uh, uh, location for trains up, Beverly, uh, up the Saddle Mountains, and uh, it had a small depot. It was a, a wind-blown little outpost. Uh, uh, there were some people that uh, really thought it was a hardship posting out here, and uh, uh, it, it was just a small community on the banks of the Columbia River. Uh, and right here, you notice that 
there are no eaves on this side of the depot. The winds were so high that at one time they picked up a part of this roof. And when the, the bridge and building people repaired it, they just cut off the eaves so it was flush and there was no opportunity for the wind to uplift the root, roof another time. So this is interesting little location. This uh, uh, The other side of the depot is a small annex where uh, clerical forces were added here to do the paperwork in the building to accommodate the traffic, the extra traffic that was going into the Hanford Nuclear Reservation during World War II. And again, this was a secret operation that uh, a lot of, you know, most people did not know or did not even have a clue of what was going on until after the dropping of the atomic bomb over Japan. Uh, from that aerial photo, I pointed out the uh, Sentinel Gap. This is what it looks like on the trail side, on the Beverly Junction side, the west side. There's this is the uh, Saddle Mountains west of the Columbia River, and this is the Saddle Mountains east of the Columbia River, uh, also known uh, Long Crab Creek. And and the uh, right of way takes a turn and takes you across the Columbia River. It's a fascinating geological. Uh, situation where a river cuts through a mountain range carved out by the ice age floods. So the Beverly Bridge went through a rehabilitation during its abandonment. Uh, the rails were pulled up, the ties, the cross ties and the wood beams were just left behind. Uh, much of the cantonary uh, supports were left behind and it was decked over with concrete. This is uh, what it looked like before the the side railing was uh, added to this bridge. And finally, the Beverly Bridge was opened on April 8th, 2022 with great fanfare. Uh, we had marching bands and, uh, and, and trail users and uh, 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 a number of dignitaries, including uh, Governor Inslee and, and members of various uh, communities uh, representing this connection uh, of a cross-state route. And so the Beverly Bridge continues to serve its purpose as a transportation role, a connector from the east side of the, to the west side. And, and uh, once again, it, it's uh, massive engineering and it, uh, continues to serve us. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a railroad on it, but it is absolutely fortunate that we are able to retain this bridge and be able to use it. And just, uh, just some kind of personal notes. Uh, this, this crossing this bridge is a is a exhilarating experience. You can you can cross it from either the Beverly Junction side or or a Beverly Trailhead, and just to share with you, here's a here's an eagle crossing the river while we're crossing the Beverly Bridge. That's Wanapon Dam up river uh, over there, and and here is an eagle in free flight. And uh, during the uh, during the John Wayne ride, uh, horse riders go across this bridge. And this is just an example of sometimes how I feel crossing this bridge, a sense of exhilaration and wonderment, just being out in this big country crossing the Columbia River. Next, we cross, uh, we travel well over 100 miles and, and go from Beverly into eastern Washington across the Channel Scablands into the Palouse. And this is the Rosalia Concrete Arch Bridges, which uh, uh, cross a valley carved out by Pine Creek, the south of Rosalia. And we cross an inter, a former interurban line as well as a active rail line that was 
uh, operated by the Northern Pacific in its day known as the Pelusin Lewiston branch. Uh, this is uh, what that valley looked like. Uh, we're going, we're, we're looking at the east, looking toward the west. That's the crossing of the Northern Pacific that was already in place. Uh, you can see some poles out there. And uh, there was the interurban line over there, um, Pine Creek, and then the the railroad, the Milwaukee Road right of way went through a cut and turned toward the north into the town of Rosalia. And this is just a, a construction that was being taken taken place. The uh, the railroad had some difficulty with the tunnel on the east side of the. Uh, uh, the bridge, they went through a through a, a hill and this tunnel was very unstable. And so what the Milwaukee Road did is they daylighted this tunnel. But while they were daylighting this tunnel, they also built a, a shoe fly or a temporary track connection around uh, the tunnel area. And... Uh, and this is part of the construction that was going on. And during all this tunnel construction, uh, part of the uh, part of the wooden bridge was filled in, and later on, uh, they uh, used concrete to uh, to uh, complete the bridge as we know it now. And just one thing that I like about this photo is. The fact that the um, uh, the original building of the Milwaukee between 1906 and 1909 used a lot of steam power, used a lot of heavy equipment and modern machinery. And yet during the construction of the shoe fly and, and a lot of this work, we see horses in place. And this is this is part of the construction camp uh, during this uh uh, rehabilitation or or daylighting of the tunnel, and there's very much horses in evidence as part of the construction process. So, but with this uh, tunnel daylighting, a lot of fill was dumped off, and the uh, the um, wooden trussle was being replaced by concrete arches. And this is, uh, uh, you can see over, over the course of some progress where the wooden forms were used, uh, uh, concrete was poured from a tower up above. There was a mixing plant down in the valley. And uh, this was quite a, this was quite a major project. But in the foreground, you see the interurban railroad coming through here, the Spokane and Inland Empire which ran from Spokane to uh, uh, Colfax, Washington, through Rosalia. <clears throat> Just various, various pictures during the, the, uh, during the uh, construction. As you can see, the progress is being made, that, uh, that the span is, is now being filled out. There's that tower for pouring concrete. One of the uh, a wonderful photo showing a steam locomotive crossing over there. It's, uh, this would be an this would be an eastbound freight train. And so this bridge work was completed in in 1915 over the uh, over Pine Creek. Uh, graceful arches. It. Uh, the, the bridge received recognition for its uh, engineering and uh, and the trade press uh, uh, had articles about uh, uh, the construction of this bridge and the techniques that it used. Uh, it, it, this bridge was a little different or it was quite a bit different than the steel bridges you, you saw on the Milwaukee Road in, in uh, over Snoqualmie Pass or... Uh, or in the Bitterroot Mountains of Montana, uh, Idaho and Montana, uh, it's uh, there is a concrete arch uh, in uh, uh, Cabin Creek, 
west of Easton, but uh, uh, this, I believe, is the only bridge of this kind of scale on the Milwaukee Road in the West uh, Pacific extension. Uh, these are some plans for the for the arches. Uh, this photo here uh, features the uh, the Northern Pacific tracks reaching underneath the Milwaukee Road uh, right of way underneath the bridge. And it served the Milwaukee Road well uh, over the years. Uh, we have a photo of a, an eastbound freight train crossing over the interurban on a on a deck bridge that's uh, uh, it was actually a steel bridge that was uh, had concrete poured over the top to to blend in with the look of the bridge followed by the arches and then this is a uh, this plow under photo shows the uh, an eastbound diesel freight with the uh, interurban line which later became a great northern branch line to Colfax and there's Pine Creek. And there's the arch for the Northern Pacific or the uh, P and L branch. And this is the Palouse, the hills of the Palouse, and we know these hills well. They're uh, uh, they're very productive wheat and, and grain growing uh, uh, grounds. Uh, it's the, the Palouse in Whitman County is a very, very productive wheat growing area. Uh, we're looking, we're looking eastbound uh, down the Milwaukee right of way. And this is the cut that uh, was formerly the tunnel that was daylighted. And we're seeing a northbound uh, Burlington Northern train on what was the Palouse and Lewiston line. This is uh, uh, this train would be heading to Spokane. We see these forty-foot box cars, and, and in the early days of the Burlington Northern, you could see all the different the different road names uh, of the components of the Burlington Northern. Uh, for example, the Burlington Northern Pacific, uh, and then some Burlington Northern uh, uh, box cars with the Great Northern Caboose. And so this, this is Pine Creek in the foreground, heading under, uh, heading under what now, uh, what once was the uh, Inland Empire Highway toward Rosalia and Spokane. So the Rosalia uh, Bridge is is I would consider this a very iconic bridge and. Uh, and to this day, you can still make out one remnant of the Milwaukee Road. As you can see, there's a bit of the logo still remains painted on this bridge. Uh, the bridge went through some structural repairs and uh, or uh, some of the scaling and, and uh, work was done to uh, to reinforce and uh, and help uh, the surface of this bridge, especially over over that in, former Inland Empire Highway, and so that was completed in uh, 2021. So this uh, Rosalia concrete. Wayne Pioneer wagons and riders with their horses going eastbound after a wonderful day and a wonderful ride through the Palouse. And so this is a, a drone view of the overall look of the now it's the S Spokane, Spangle, and Palouse. Uh, a short line railroad operating on uh, on on the former Palouse and Lewiston track. Uh, the the just about uh, 
uh, and this is the uh, at Pine Creek. This uh, this uh, this bridge is uh, the first crossing of Pine Creek. Excuse me. This is the first crossing of Pine Creek, and uh, there were a number more as the Milwaukee crossed the meandering Pine Creek between Rosalia and Rock Lake. Uh, and here is the inlet. Inland Empire or Palouse Highway. And then the right of way of the interurban. And that's the town of Rosalia right down there. Lastly, uh, the last bridge on our tour is the Tico Bridge. And uh, it was, it's frequently referred to as the Tico Trestle. However, technically it's known as a viaduct. And it was built from the start as a lasting bridge. And giving an example of the engineering uh, preparation for this bridge, this is a plan for the masonry, for the, for the pilings uh, or for the support of the bridge and uh and this is the the plan for the steel work it all the all the intricate all the intricate details of the engineering of this bridge uh these plans were found in the milwaukee road milwaukee public library archives in milwaukee wisconsin as part of the milwaukee public library uh, the bridge was constructed with a um, device called a traveler crane. It it's a similar. It was the same crane used in the Bitterroot Mountains, and this is a a display found in the Wallace Idaho Depot Museum. Uh, this is a an end scale replica of how the traveler crane worked. But what the purpose was to extend the steel work from the portion of the bridge that was completed out, reaching out into the air beyond where the bridge was constructed. And so, as you can see, it it has a, uh, the, it has a very long reach. Um, the overhang was 60 feet. So these are pictures of the traveler crane used in the bitter roots. Where you can see the this this portion of the bridge is load bearing, and then they can extend their steel work beyond. And so that same technique was used at Tico, where you can see some local some local folks in their in their finery coming out and watching a bridge being built. And, and so this took place over the summer of uh, summer and fall of 1908. And actually uh, down below is the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, and the traveler crane was brought in by Union Pacific, hauled up to the uh, to the west side of the right of way. And so they they built this bridge from west to east. So as you can see, the 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 concrete supports were uh, concrete piers were built were set early and then the vertical uh, vertical supports and then the deck 
uh, two individual deck beams were uh, were set into that, or girders. This is a the last one more one more girder one more pair of girders to go and the bridge will be will be complete and uh this the the wonderful thing about this is you can see it some people standing on that uh traveler crane and you can see some people out on the decking there and just incredible amount of rigging and the scope and size of this machine working its way across but uh, one thing that's that's so special about this is you see these these people on the east bank of the right of way, and these folks are uh, just local townspeople, and chances are they're dressed up in their nice finery, coming out to watch a bridge being built, and. If you notice, there's umbrellas or parasols that the ladies would have to protect their fair skin from the harsh sun. So this is a, just a kind of an interesting, interesting moment of the construction where local townspeople would come out and actually see the construction of the railroad. So this is the completed bridge across the uh, across the valley. Uh, that's the Union Pacific Railroad uh, coming from Spokane into Tico, and from from Tico, the Union Pacific had a uh, a small terminal and roundhouse serving uh, the Wallace uh, Mining District in Idaho, as well as going south. Uh, to connect toward their routes to Walla Walla and Pendleton. The Union Pacific is gone from this area as well as the Milwaukee. But during the diesel days, uh, uh, Professor Robert Beachman was uh, uh, a relief agent and operator at, for the Union Pacific at Tico, and he caught the series of trains going across the Tico trestle. Uh, Anyway, uh, shortly after the eastbound, we have a westbound Milwaukee freight with uh, uh, with the U boats or U, I believe U twenty five Cs or U twenty five B locomotives going across, and the Union Pacific route down below. Uh, and the Union Pacific coming in with their with. Uh, a grain shuttle from Spokane and uh ready to head head down serving the elevators down down below. This is what the uh Chico Bridge looked like at the uh during its uh decommissioning or abandonment part of it it had a wooden wooden deck and part of the wooden deck was removed and so for the rehabilitation a, a concrete deck with uh, uh, steel side railings was installed the bridge was uh, the rehabilitation was completed and the bridge was opened in June of 2022 and this bridge now serves as uh, the crossing and Tico is a destination for the cross state ride. Uh, here we can see some horses from the John Wayne Pioneer Wagons and Riders.
there's some interpretive signs at Tico and uh and Rob Leachman was uh generous in allowing us to use his photographs to help interpret this this bridge in its later days as well as a a kiosk uh, uh which was uh installed by the John Wayne Pioneer Wagons and Riders uh, with support with the Calusta Cascades Trail Coalition. Now, this is uh, looking toward Mount Tico and the Tico Bridge, a uh, Union Pacific right of way down below, a former right of way down below, and uh, uh, a view overlooking the town of uh, Tico. So this Tico Bridge is a, a a landmark for the area. Back in the day, this would have been the mate, uh, a Union Pacific roundhouse, uh, junction, turntable, and, and rail facilities serving a branch to Wallace, as well as uh, continuing down to uh, toward Colfax. There's Mount Tico in the background. So thank you for joining us on this journey, uh, crossing four bridges across the state of Washington. Uh, uh, you can you can actually walk or bicycle or ride your horse or wagon across these bridges as part of the Palooza Cascades Trail, and we invite you to take advantage of that opportunity. I'd like to thank our partners and friends on this, uh, the Whitman County Library, uh, Rosalia Branch, which is the primary sponsor for Bridge Days, as well as uh, the organizations that really work to do the heavy lifting on the uh, Palooza Cascades Trail, the Washington State Parks and Recreation Commission, the John Wayne Pioneer Wagons and Riders, who really pioneered this trail with their cross-state ride, uh, the Palooza Cascades Trail Coalition, Friends of the Tico Trestle, Friends of the Palooza Cascades Trail, uh, Rails to Trails Conservancy, which is making the Palooza Cascades Trail a part of the Great American Rail Trail from Washington, D.C. to Washington State on the Pacific, yeah. as well as the Milwaukee Road Historical Association, and we thank the dedicated volunteers and friends along the way. We thank you for that. And uh, you're welcome to explore more about the history of the Milwaukee Road across Washington State by visiting Cascade Rail Foundation at the website shown here, uh, www.milwaukeeelectric.org. Well, Mark, that was great. And there's just a lot of really nice, positive comments in the chat about how enjoyable a program this was. This is just outstanding. So uh, I'm uh, going to ask for questions. Um, and if I don't have any questions, I'm going to stop the recording. Going once, going twice. This will end our recording today. <laughs>